Hello, I'm Chris Garvey. I'm a nurse practitioner from San Francisco with a background in pulmonary rehabilitation and clinical research in pulmonary fibrosis and other chronic lung diseases in pulmonary rehab. Today, I'm going to be talking about Pulmonary Rehabilitation 101 to help inform you and your provider to consider pulmonary rehabilitation and whether it would be an appropriate option for you. I wanna thank Boring Ingelheim who has generously supported this presentation. And also wanted to talk a little bit about disclaimers. So these are things to be aware of regarding today's talk. Most importantly, this is an informational discussion. It is not medical advice. This is to ideally help inform you and your provider about what pulmonary rehabilitation offers and whether it's a, a, a good option for you in terms of improving your function and your symptoms. So what is pulmonary rehabilitation? It was defined in 2013 by the American Thoracic Society as a comprehensive intervention based on a thorough patient assessment that includes three things. Patient-tailored therapies that include exercise training, self-management education, behavior change, and it's designed to improve both physical and psychological condition. Most importantly, it helps to promote long-term use of health-enhancing behaviors. Interestingly, we developed this definition in 2013, but it continues to serve us and our patients in terms of what are the areas of focus that appear to be the most helpful for our patients. So why would you consider pulmonary rehabilitation? We see that in persons with chronic lung diseases, including those with pulmonary fibrosis, can experience symptoms that are uncomfortable and tend to undermine their quality of life and function. These include worsening shortness of breath, fatigue, cough, and mood changes. And so we're very concerned because once you become less physically active, it can start to impact your ability to be independent and impair your quality of life. So pulmonary rehabilitation works specifically to improve physical function and exercise capacity, as well as symptoms, including breathlessness, quality of life and mood in persons with chronic lung disease. So there's two main features or pillars of pulmonary rehabilitation that work in this regard. Supervised exercise is the cornerstone of pulmonary rehabilitation, but we also um, emphasize self-management education and training to help you to adapt to things you're, you're dealing with as parts of these chronic breathing problems. So where would you find a pulmonary rehabilitation program? Their programs in the United States are quite often located in hospital outpatient departments and similar to physical therapy. A directory for pulmonary rehabilitations can be found at the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation website if you look under program directory. Additionally, uh, another directory that the ATS developed can be found at livebetter.org as well as information about pulmonary rehab and um, features regarding that. So persons with chronic lung disease are normally referred to pulmonary rehabilitation by their clinical provider or their pulmonary physician. In the United States, most pulmonary rehabilitation programs are located in urban or suburban settings. There's fewer in rural settings, and we're working on that nationally to make it a more equitable um, availability of services. So you may be wondering about, well, hospitals, COVID, is this safe? Those are important questions to ask and to be feel informed about. So pulmonary rehabilitation programs by and large in the US have worked very carefully and very hard to improve COVID related safety for both patients and staff. This includes providing pulmonary rehabilitation to smaller numbers of patients at a given time, as well as emphasizing personal protective equipment, hand hygiene, 
physical distancing, screening of both staff and patients, and other features to promote maximum safety for everyone during this important time. So the process to understand if pulmonary rehabilitation is right for you begins with assessment. And this would begin with an assessment by your provider who knows your medical history and should be um, aware of what your symptoms are and your need for oxygen. So all of this should be looked at initially to see if, are you indeed a good candidate for a rehab program? Are you safe for exercise in a rehab setting? So understanding your an accurate diagnosis of your chronic breathing problem, your symptoms, your oxygen needs, if any, and your history of medical problems. If you have a history of heart disease, orthopedic issues, neurological issues and balance, that can often need to be considered as part of safe exercise in a rehab setting. So if you and your clinician decide that you are stable and appropriate for pulmonary rehabilitation exercise and program, they would typically refer you. And then as part of the pulmonary rehabilitation program, you will undergo further assessment. They'll provide um, uh, questionnaires that will help to better inform exactly where you are with your symptoms, your physical function and mood and quality of life and goals. And they'll do um, some standardized exercise testing to measure where you are currently prior to per, per participating in the pulmonary rehabilitation. And then importantly, they're going to evaluate all of those features at the end of the pulmonary rehabilitation. So you can see how and where you've improved and you and the pulmonary rehab providers and your clinician can set the stage for long-term um, control and management of your needs and also your physical function to be optimized to the best level possible. Finally, one of the things you wanna be thinking about is what would you like to do differently as part of participating in pulmonary rehabilitation? Your program, your provider may have their goals. They may want you to have stable oxygen level and better function, but you may have your own goals. So think of those. You might wanna to go to a ball game or you might wanna visit family. Think of the things that you haven't been able to do that you would like to do so those can be considered. So exercise, again, is the cornerstone of pulmonary rehabilitation. Aerobic exercise is the first component. So aerobic training often focuses on walking, stationary bicycles, sitting elliptical trainers that exercise the upper and lower body, and other exercises that work larger muscles. So this helps to improve fitness and function. Resistance training, on the other hand, includes Weightlifting, using, such as using small weights, elastic bands, weight machines, and wall push-ups. So this works to improve muscle volume and strength. Interestingly, it can be associated with less shortness of breath than aerobic training. So both aerobic and resistance training are used and have a critical role in improving your function in, in the context of pulmonary rehab. A warm-up and cool-down of slower exercise, such as walking or stretching for normally three to five minutes before and after exercise helps to promote both safe exercise and reduces muscle soreness. So we find that when people are able to exercise consistently over time, they often feel more in control of shortness of breath. However, it's important to be aware both for exercise and pulmonary rehabilitation it won't completely eliminate shortness of breath. And it's not, pulmonary rehabilitation will not cure lung disease. It actually doesn't change lung function. What it does is it helps to improve muscle fitness and things outside the lungs that make breathing and function better. I often think of my patients and sometimes tell them, you have lung disease, but you don't have muscle disease. So by putting your getting your muscles to the best level of function possible, you can do more and feel better. Exercise prescription. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but interestingly in pulmonary rehabilitation, exercise is considered a fairly structured framework 
to make exercise as successful and helpful as possible for you, and also individualized to your own personal needs. So we want to know what exercise to do, how often, how much, how long, and when to increase it. So it's much, um, much more detailed and structured than you might imagine. Um, we certainly want to make it successful and safe. What we see in people with breathing problems is they sometimes have good days and bad days. And you want to have some idea or context of what you're going to do on good days and bad days and how you should approach that. So your therapist will work with you to guide you to keep the exercise safe and helpful. Well, I'm recording this talk um, right before the Super Bowl. And the reason I bring that up is it's important to consider that some level of shortness of breath, certainly mild, but usually between mild and moderate, is common during exercise and it's expected. So your rehab therapist is going to, and the reason I mentioned the Super Bowl is if you look at those football players, when they're working, they're short of breath. But you want to have a sense of what level is safe for you and how do you keep yourself in that particular level? So exercise prescription, think of FIT, F-I-T-T. -T. That's the abbreviation or the acronym for frequency, intensity, time, and type. So frequency, usually three to five days a week of aerobic training. Although walking every day for most people is sometimes a good idea just to keep moving. Um, intensity, you wanna know how hard you should work. They, um, there's different scales available, such as the Borg scale that uses a zero to 10 point scale, especially the uh, Borg um, category ratio scale um, that measures breathlessness or exertion. And it'll give you a sense of where to keep your breathing intensity or the in exertion, the amount of work you're providing. Time, how, how much? Well, usually beginning at a tolerable level. It's important to know that when you go to pulmonary rehabilitation, they are not there to overwork you. And it's going to be something that you'll find um, usually acceptable in terms of the workload and the amount. And if you find it's too much, let them know. They definitely wanna know. Um, so begin at a tolerable level. For some people, that might just be a couple of minutes if you haven't been active. Um, for people that have been more active, it could be up to 20 to 30 minutes during a, a session or more, um, depending on what's deemed appropriate. Again, walking, stationary bicycle, sitting elliptical could be a type of aerobic training. Um, swimming, certainly, if you have the facility and it's safe for you and it's something that you like. And you know, using oxygen with swimming might be a little more tricky, but it has been done by some patient and something you'd want to really learn about before you approach. So how do we make exercise successful? This is a challenge for people with breathing problems. It's a challenge for everyone, unless you're really a, an exercise fanatic. Um, you want it to be safe and fun, important. It should be convenient. It needs to be affordable. It should be pleasant or at least tolerable. And again, needs to be safe. So all of this needs to be part of considering who you are and what works best for you. Think about yourself and what, what you think would suit you. You wanna have some indoor options. Certainly the weather may be a barrier to outdoor, outdoor exercise or, or allergies or I live in California, we certainly have issues with smoke during fire. So you definitely wanna have some indoor options um, such as sit and be fit videos, um, something that is an, an alternative. What we're finding now with technology and uh, providing um, additional options is that using apps or pedometers or your smartphone to measure steps or to help you with exercise can be and uh, it can augment our ability to do exercise, to do it more, and to measure our goals and gradually improve our exercise uh, level of fitness. So I wanna emphasize the importance of distraction. What we find is when we listen to music and when our patients listen to music, it's easier to exercise and you can do more. It takes your mind off of the shortness of breath and actually, to be honest, the boredom 
that can be associated with exercise. Um, so distraction, watching TV. Also think about using a fan or opening a window to give yourself a sensation of more airflow that can make exercise more comfortable for some. So some tools to consider, again, apps using a, a phone or, um, or a um, pedometer or a tracker, some type of device, see, see what suits you in terms of um, this. Some phones have GPS or they have accelerometers that can help to measure your steps and work. Um, this is a rollator. So you've probably seen these before. Um, obviously it's a walker and it has four wheels. This one has brakes and it has a seat and it's got a little um, basket to carry things. So what we find in some people with chronic breathing problems is this helps them to walk further. Um, I wouldn't run out and buy one without talking to your provider and ideally your rehab staff. They may even have one you can try out. Um, so if it, it's, it's a good option for you to walk further and more comfortably, then it could help you to do more. Um, you can imagine if you're short of breath or feeling fatigued, it has a seat there that you can stop and rest, but know how to use one safely. Obviously, you wouldn't want to use it on a hill or uneven pavement, and I would be with somebody that could help you the first time. The sturdier ones tend to be the safer. However, they tend to be a little bit heavier and don't collapse quite as easy to get it in and out of cars. So it's kind of like buying a computer. You really want to be informed before you go down that road. This is a, a stepper. Um, sometimes people use these in the home. Um, they're not super expensive. And if your knees and hips are working reasonably well, it can uh, allow you to start to introduce exercise in the home or an option, even when you're watching TV. So talk to your provider and see if that's a good option for you if, if you think you need um, something on that level. Shortness of breath is a huge challenge for people with chronic breathing problems, including pulmonary fibrosis. So my colleague, Susan Jacobs at Stanford, um, used this slide and I borrowed it from her to talk about some techniques you might consider. Control of shortness of breath. Um, one of the techniques we've used in pulmonary rehab for a long time is called purse lip breathing. So this works for some, but not everybody. And the concept is you inhale slowly through your nose for a count of two, and you slowly exhale through purse lips, like you're blowing out a candle for a count of four. And you practice that slow breathing technique, usually about 10 times or 10 breaths in a row, four times a day. And you may find that this slows down your breathing and makes it more comfortable um, to do more. So it's something you could consider and you'll certainly discuss it with you in rehab. We talked about using a fan or cool air or open window to improve the sensation of getting more air. Relaxation techniques can be helpful such as visual imagery or meditation. We talked about distraction, how important that can be. Um, social interaction can be good. Being around people you like um, and enjoy being with can be helpful. Yoga, um, typically modified to make sure it's something you feel you can work with and it's comfortable for you. Most of my patients do not like getting on the floor um, because they find it hard to get up. So be sure it's something you think you can work with. Oxygen, if you need it. Oxygen, if your oxygen levels are chronically low, if you use oxygen, it may help you to live longer. And in some people, but not all, it can help them to feel less short of breath. Exercise, yes, over time can improve um, symptoms um, and uh, most specifically shortness of breath. If your shortness of breath is chronic and it's present at moderate level at rest, talk to your doctor about medication. Are there medications that you should take to um, improve your breathing comfort. So the Blue Marble Health um, Group uh, provided these illustrations to me and they're illustrations to be used if you're short of breath. They don't work for everybody, but you could try them. The ones in the top row, what they have in common is they give the lungs a lot of space to swing out and open up during inhalation. So these may take a little bit of the workload off the lungs. All right, well, let's talk about education. Where does education fit? 
it helps us to adapt and manage um, the symptoms that we face and the challenges caused by chronic lung disease. Symptom management being one of the more important techniques to control shortness of breath, cough, and fatigue, both at rest and with activity. We talked about a few of these. And in rehab, they'll talk about coping with these. And again, if you need oxygen, rehab is a good place to learn a lot about it and see what's out there for you and you know, learn the pros and cons and how to get the most out of it. What about worse breathing and or lung infections? You want to understand how to prevent them, how to identify them, how to talk to your colleague, or your, your provider about it and when and how to treat those. So you feel more prepared about how you're gonna um, handle that if it occurs. Oxygen is not a simple undertaking, but it can be of great help to some people. So you wanna know the most you can about it, how to use it, how to monitor yourself with something called an oximeter. What levels are your goals? What's safe and when to, when to um, pay attention to it and what to do if your readings are getting lower. Um, and safety is quite important. And then finally, how to work um, as helpfully as possible with your medical equipment company who provides the equipment. Medications are available. There's medications for pulmonary fibrosis. And if you have interstitial lung disease, there are some medication options. You really want to know the most you can about these medications and how to get the most out of them. You want to understand how to use them and possible side effects, and for some of them, how to um, pay for them. So these are all important things to help you get to the best level possible with your health. What we see in people with chronic breathing problems is it can have an impact on their mood, specifically depression and anxiety. Also, stress can be an issue. Being ill or not being able to do the things you want to do can be a real challenge. So you want to have a toolkit, a, a strategy for how you are going to feel more in control of those symptoms and ideally improve them. That's really important. Um, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation has a nice directory of support groups, particularly for people with pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease. And this can be really helpful. You really don't want to feel like you're the only one going through this. If you're not using oxygen, you probably look like everybody else. And people may not realize just how much you're suffering some of the time and that you, you really want to feel like you're managing it to the best level possible. Um, your family may be of some support or great support and friends as well. It's also nice if you're in a group setting in rehab. Um, people in rehab are great support to each other um, in, in much of the experience that I've seen um, in rehab settings. Re whether you have fibrosis or COPD, people are all going through shortness of breath and the impact on their life, and they're not able to do all of the things they want to do. And then pretty much most of them, if not all of them that I work with, improve on some levels, if not all. So some, there's usually benefit to derive from pulmonary rehab, but getting encouragement from others um, and learning from others and other people learning from you, what you've learned and what you have to share. Some other strategies for addressing mood, relaxation techniques, distraction can be helpful, exercise, if you can get into a fitness program that works for you and get stronger and be able to do more, it can help control your mood. Conversely, if you are able to manage your mood and control it, it can help you to be more independent. So these all work hand in hand. So counseling can be helpful. We've seen in the last 15, 20 years, the role of medication in depression and anxiety, and it can be important and helpful, particularly if the symptoms are moderate to severe. And so in rehab, they'll help you to assess those, and then you would work with your provider for treatment options. Our daily activities can often be impacted by chronic breathing problems, symptoms, fatigue, and being out of physical shape. So learning how to adapt, controlling shortness of breath, the stair climbing can be important, certainly in San Francisco where pretty much everybody has stairs. If you don't get shortness of breath going upstairs and going up hills, you're probably doing pretty good. Um, bending over can be a trigger for shortness of breath because your lungs tend to get um, deflated to some degree by your, your 
intestines in your stomach that push into them. So what I would say is if you're, um, instead of bending over, hold on to a very solid piece of furniture and try bending at the knees and the hips versus bending your um, bending over at the waist. Um, so your lungs and your chest have room to expand while you're bending over. Meal preparation, housework, um, things to help you to feel less short of breath. Um, pacing to give yourself a rest period in between um, activity to make it easier. But, um, and then last but definitely not least, advanced directives. This is a key area where we all should be thinking about how do we want the later chapters of our life to look and what are our priorities and what are our questions? You don't wanna feel like you don't know or that your wishes might not be considered. So this is a conversation to have with your provider and you may need to make a, a specific appointment just to talk about this. So you really want enough time to be sure you understand what your options are. What are the later chapters gonna look like? And do they understand your priorities? Perhaps you want to um, ideally be at home um, or you wanna be around your loved ones. So be sure to talk about areas of uncertainty and how um, ideally everyone's on the same page. And if this changes over time, have that conversation with your provider and your loved ones. So some of all these parts is quality of life. What matters to you? Your wishes and your goals need to be part of your overall plan. So what do you value? Um, some people value independence. They want, may wanna be with family. They may wanna be in control. This may not work perfectly, but you want to be at the best level possible. Okay, what about resources? So the AACVPR has some nice resources, including a program directory for you. Um, and you'll, you'll see some good information. And this is available if you, you can do it, a search by geographical, geographical locations. Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation is a tremendous resource, especially for persons with pulmonary fibrosis um, and has so many features that I find really helpful and really important. And then finally, the American Thoracic Society, livebetter.org specifically addresses pulmonary rehabilitation information for patients. And there's other information there that you may find helpful. So what about alternatives to center-based pulmonary rehabilitation? Um, virtual pulmonary rehabilitation, as, as you can imagine, is tele-rehab. Um, and I want to say importantly, this is in its infancy in the U.S. So it's just beginning to um, be available, but in a very limited uh, way. I want to emphasize it is definitely not for everyone. It is not the same as center-based pulmonary rehab, and I want to comment on that. So the assessment of breathlessness, oxygen levels, exercise, that's going to be done at least in part by you because the provider is not there with you in your home. So this takes a unique person to be able to do this independently or with minimal supervision. So this is going to get better over time, but we're beginning to look at it and beginning to understand it better. So that, that's my comment. Um, if you do decide that this is something you want to explore and you're most importantly, you have to engage your provider very carefully because they have to work with you to understand, is this safe? Is this a good option for you? Are you the right candidate? Or should you go to pulmonary rehab in the center? Or should you go to physical therapy? Um, so reducing your risks of falls is quite important because nobody's gonna be assessing this in real time except you and your family. So there needs to be an area for exercise without obstruction or hazards such as electrical cords or throw rug or long oxygen tubing that you could trip over. Um, involving your family member to help, to, especially if you need help or if you're not doing well, because there's not gonna be a provider there in real time to help problem solve. So as you can imagine, this is definitely more complex. So things to consider. Uh, is, are you a good candidate for safe home exercise? 
Again, discuss this with your provider. You need to know how to monitor and assess your oxygen levels using an oximeter. So you need to know how to use it. And I would spend time with your provider going over this. What are your goals? What to do if your level is below your goal? So you're, it's really, you're the one driving some of this. So you wanna be sure you're comfortable and ready for that. If oxygen is ordered, what setting to use? And should you adjust this? Um, this is something you wanna do in collaboration with your provider versus on your own. Um, so it, oxygen is a medication. It's much more complex than turning it up and down based on how you feel. Learning to monitor your heart rate and your shortness of breath, both at rest and with ex exercise are critical and how to interpret it. What, what does it mean and what to do about it? Blood pressure can be very important because it can go up with exercise and you wanna make sure that's safe. So again, being informed, being an expert before you approach this. When to stop exercise, this is important. I've listed some comments here about when you might stop exercise and get help. But again, this is something that you really wanna feel prepared for. Certainly moderate to severe breathlessness or fatigue or weakness that don't improve if you rest or use oxygen or your inhaler, you need to get help. Um, and so you need to have a plan in place for that before you exercise. Chest pain, usually that means call 911 or go to the emergency room. So a conversation before you exercise to have with your provider. Muscle pain that doesn't improve with rest, feeling dizzy or faint, any leg pain, weakness or cramping, sweating that's more than usual. So this is somewhere and to some degree where you have to become an expert. So in summary, pulmonary rehabilitation offers exercise normally supervised in an outpatient hospital um, department. And I would say for pulmonary fibrosis, probably the safest setting um, for most patients. Um, and as far as we know, it is the safest setting at this time. We're learning more about remote, but we, have, we still have a fair amount to learn. Learning to cope and adapt. Your ability to adapt to what you're having to live with is critical to how well you're gonna do. Support, getting support from others dealing with similar concerns. Many that intend um, pulmonary rehabilitation find that they're more fit, they have fewer symptoms, they have better mood, and they have improved quality of life. So this would be something that you could um, anticipate may indeed happen for you. Generally, pulmonary rehabilitation, particularly center-based, is safe. We think that remote has potential for being safe, but again, most of the research has been done in COPD and not fibrosis. So center-based is, is certainly um, safer at this point. And then finally, the focus is you. What do you want to improve in partnership with your provider? So what that means is when you go to pulmonary rehabilitation, it should be targeting and suited to your needs, your unique and individual needs. If you find that it's not, it's not really addressing what you need to get out of it, I would bring that up early um, and talk about what your goals are and what you'd like to achieve and have that conversation. Um, so really, uh, we, we want you to improve and it needs to suit you. I wanna thank you for joining me today. And I wanna thank you for taking a informed role in approaching how to manage your chronic breathing problem and what might be some options to get you to a better level. Thank you and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.